fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Right now we're bringing in uh, M. William Phelps. And people might know him from uh, all the books that he's written. Um, maybe uh, the Dark Minds series. Um, thanks for being here, uh, Matt. Oh, great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, call me Matthew. Yeah. Hey, you know, and, and Matt, now I have to bring this up. Um, we were talking sure. about mail call, and I just want to, the last time you were on the show, um, you um, were uh, talking about one of your books, and uh, we got a little bit of backlash here on um, people... <laughs> Now this is getting a little silly, but we got a few few people saying that uh, because you said on on the show that you hope people would enjoy your books, like enjoy reading your book, and I've got about eight eight people that have written in saying uh, um, that that they thought it was a bit much to say enjoy. How could you enjoy reading about murder? Um, and. Uh, the the best way I could answer that is to say that you meant enjoy your writing style. Well, first of all, people are too literal today. Every, everything you say, <laughs> everything you do is judged. Uh, uh, every single thing today. You know, we see that with just turn on the news. Um, especially if you're in the spotlight or a quasi-celebrity, what have you. Uh, to, to tell people to enjoy my books, I meant, you know, Get some enjoyment out of reading my books. You know, learn something. Uh, I write nonfiction books. I write about crime. And lots of people who write to me, fans, if you will, talk about how much they've learned through reading my books about the people involved. So, you know, look, yeah. eight people out of how many people you got listening? I don't even consider that, uh, 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 you know, yeah. worthy of, uh, you know. But, but look, but but look, the, the bottom line with it is every single thing that is said today or done is judged uh, with a magnifying glass. And it's, it's out of hand today. Oh, uh, that's crazy. Uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, look, enjoy my lawn. Enjoy my dog. Enjoy, <laughs> you know. Just, well, you know, and I, 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 I try to answer in the fact that you're saying enjoy my, I mean, because I write books too. And when you write books, you put your personality into it, your style, you put feeling, and and you hope people enjoy what you're putting out there not not as in like oh i'm going to take pleasure because we're talking about a serial yeah, take pleasure in, mur in someone getting murdered uh if anybody knows anything about my career it's that i'm a victim's advocate number one and number two the murder really is a very 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 minute portion of the book it's 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 the reason for the book really but it's the stone in the water and all the ripples around that stone are the people involved their lives what happened um, the, the, the hero, if you will, detective who solves the case and uh, uh, the victim's family members who want to talk about the victim and take the victim and, and not have the victim be just a headline, but have that victim become now a person, you know. So uh, that's what I do with my writing. So uh, I, ho I would hope someone would enjoy that part of my work. Yeah, and, and, and I have to say that that's why I kind of br wanted to bring that up also because I wanted people to... Uh, to realize that you, you, when you write your books, your books bring attention and focus on victims and what happens to right. the victims. We're talking about that, and we're talking about trying to help people that have been hurt. And it's it's right. not it's not we're not glorifying people that are, you know, bad people and murderers. And I I just thought it would be a a point to start out with because when when I get that kind of comment I, I I want people to realize look if you're listening we're talking about this because we this is something we do and um, right 
I, I just uh, so I'm in total support. I just want to make sure that uh, have you address that in that sort of way because I I know that you know you you're doing the right thing. You do some great work, so we're in thanks, support. Thanks. You know, and, it's you know, and and and, and people. People connected to any murder, uh, either either uh, through relatives or people connected through law enforcement or people connected through the community, they like to have a voice. And, and, and writing a book about a case sometimes gives them a voice uh, that they didn't have before. So, so, you know, I pride myself in that type of uh, journalism that I bring to the, to the table when I, when I do a book. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, a perfect example is Targeted, which we're going to talk about. Uh, uh, you know, this is a, this is a book that, that the, one of the only reasons I wrote this book is because in this book, Targeted, uh, it, I mean, it's not the only reason, but it's a major thing that got me interested in writing this book was that the victim's mother, Carol Benton, the victim's name is Doug Benton, the victim's mother believes that the person responsible in prison for this murder is innocent. And that just, boom, you know, got me interested right away that the victim's mother believes the killer is innocent. Um, uh, so when I, when I hear about that, I, I want to dig deeper, you know. So, that, that, you know, uh, and, 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 and the murder is the impetus for the book, uh, absolutely, but it's the people. It's the people involved. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's people's stories. It's their life. It, right. it means something. And if someone's in jail for something that they didn't do, that, you've taken away someone's freedom, and and that's important, right. you know. And they they've got to realize that that, that it, it's important to bring that out. Um, it, it, something needs to be done with the justice system if we've got a lot of people away that didn't do things, and um, so it, it's really important. I'm behind that. So so Target, how did how did you get involved in it? Like what what brought you in? I know you were sort of saying that it was because of the mother. Um, what was the story about? Let's go through some of the, the details. Well, I mean, this book in particular, this case, was introduced to me by a producer for a show that I'm on uh, a lot called Snapped on Oxygen. And uh, the producer who produced this episode, Tracy Fortson, episode for Snapped, called me one day and said, Matt, you know, you, you're the guy to look into this. You, uh, I, 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 This is an interesting case. It takes place in Georgia. What you have is you have a... A uh, amateur bodybuilder, steroid user, uh, kind of angry guy, uh, welder, owns his own welding business, found inside of a horse, horse trough filled with cement, and he's been shot in the head, and this horse trough is found on a piece of property, uh, a cattle, cattle property farming, uh, a farm, a cattle farm way out in, in, in the pasture. I mean, two, three miles away from the main uh, uh, home, uh, the main cattle ranch. Um, and it's found in a, in a secluded area, and it's sitting there. And it just happened to be found by the cow hand who was on his ATV out there one day in the woods chasing something, uh, chasing down something, and he comes across this. And so that's the beginning, of, uh, uh, really, of the story for, for, for this, is that you have this guy... And his girlfriend is a sheriff, a deputy, a deputy, sheriff's deputy in the, in the county. And uh, almost right away, uh, the investigation focuses on her, hence the title Targeted. Um, it, 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 it focuses right on her. Well, However, was... you know, as being a book writer, you know that the best titles are dual titles. So yeah. Targeted could also mean that the, sh the sheriff's deputy, Tracy Fortson, Targeted her boyfriend and murdered him. No, no. Was she was she the target of police or a suspect because she was the wife, or is it because she was a, a, an officer? She was the girlfriend, um, and and no, neither of those reasons. I mean, she likes to say, and I interviewed her for almost a year. Uh, I interviewed lots of people around her, uh, all all her supporters, if you will. Say you know, say just what you said. They targeted her because she was the boyfriend, uh, the girlfriend, and because uh, they had just broken up, and because of some other issues involving the sheriff's department, where she had left about two months before the murder, and claiming that there was some sexual harassment going on in the office. 
um, and, 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 and she wasn't being treated fairly. And if you ask her supporters and her, she'll say, yeah, I was targeted for that reason. If you ask me, and I look at the documentation and the evidence left behind, no one was targeted. The investigation follows the evidence, and the evidence that they're getting leads to her. And so they begin to question her, and then they start uncovering evidence. And every single rock that they pick up is another clue that leads directly to her. So as an investigator, you, you can't overlook uh, something that's obvious. You can't do it. Wow. And and so when, when this happened, do, do we know why or did we have an idea of why someone wanted him dead? Like when it first happened, did the girlfriend, the police, did she sort of have this, oh, it was probably this person or... Was was there any thought of, of if, if he had enemies? Well, what? Well, this comes later. The enemies come later, which is suspect to me. Uh, but what happens is he goes missing. So her, she and her boyfriend, they have a little spat, and it's kind of the last straw for him. He's done with her. Uh, they've been going like eight months together, and they were lifting weights, and she was controlling, and she didn't want him to hang out with his friends. And she was coming in, in between his weightlifting and his, his bodybuilding with his, his best buddy. And she was basically just a pain in the ass. I mean, uh, he, he was just sick of her meddling in his affairs, sick of her controlling him, yelling at him. She was very angry at times. Uh, they had gotten in heated fights where guns were literally drawn and put to each other's head, Good stuff Lord. like that. Um, yeah, so... So the relationship was over, and what happens is, uh, it's very interesting uh, uh, opening to the story, uh, uh, and this is where I begin the book. You, you have this very small community in Colbert, Georgia, uh, uh, trailer, uh, trailer type homes that um, modular homes, you know, type of neighborhood. It's in, it's in the backwoods. There's, it's like a dead end street, and there's three, four houses in a cluster, a little cluster. And Doug Benton, the victim in this story, one thing he did was he was raising exotic birds. Uh, he had like thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars worth of exotic birds that he had in makeshift cages all around his property. And his neighbor goes out there one day and hasn't seen Doug for a while, and he notices that most of those birds are dead. And uh, the reason they're dead is because they haven't gotten any water and they haven't gotten any food. And this guy is like, geez, Doug would never, never not take care of his birds. I mean, some things up. So he calls the sheriff, uh, the, the sheriff's department. They come over. They do a cursory search around the property. Uh, then they get, you know, they have, they have probable cause to go in because the guy's now missing, they realize, for two weeks. This is a Friday. He's been not seen for two weeks. Nobody can report him for two weeks. So they go into the house, and they don't see anything. The house looks pretty well tidied up. Um... They go back out of the house, and while that's going on, that same weekend, you have this cowhand, as I was saying, riding his ATV out about, I'd say it's about 12, 14 miles away from where Doug lived in this farm, and he comes across this horse trough, and they, he calls the sheriff, they pick it up, it smells, and they begin chipping away at it with a hammer and a chisel, and bang, this arm pops out. And on the arm is this tattoo. And one of the deputies there says, I recognize that tattoo. That's Doug Benton. Isn't he missing? Isn't there a missing report, person report out on him? And someone says, yeah, that's, you know, Deputy Tracy Fortson's boyfriend. So this is how this story begins. And so what do you do in that case? You start, you, you know, victimology is you go, if the victim is that stone, as we talked about in the water, the first ring around that stone is everybody that victim knows. Those are the suspects right away. Because 80, I think it's 82% of, of murder in this country is done by somebody you know. That's, 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 those are the stats. So um, they start asking questions. And everybody they talk to starts to point a finger at Tracy and say, you know, she's angry, she's violent. Uh, I heard she burned a trailer down with her other ex-boyfriend in it or tried to kill him with a pipe. And they're hearing all kinds of stories. And, and like I was told, Tracy told me, well, none of those are true. Can you, can you prove it? I'm saying it, that's, that's indifferent. 
It doesn't matter at that time if those stories are true or not. This is what the police are hearing. So they're following those stories, and that leads to you. So they interview her, you know? Well, so but this must have taken quite a bit to uh, to have killed him, and that that took a lot of planning and effort. That's the, and, that's one of the first questions everybody asks: is yeah, I, all right, I'm more the than one person? Right. Well, okay, that's a great question. Everybody asks that question. Uh, Doug Benton's a 250 pound weightlifter. She is uh, 160 pound. Also, you got to understand she's a deadlifter. She lifted weights her entire life. Also, she's a she's a pretty good sized woman, but still. 160 pounds. Um, how is she going to get this guy? How is she going to kill this guy, get him into a horse trough, and get that horse trough out into the woods on a piece of property, on a piece of private property, uh, and get it off her truck without anybody knowing or without help? How is that going to happen, right? Full of concrete. Well, exactly. I mean, we're talking 3,000 pounds, maybe a ton, right? Maybe, maybe. Well, um, something in that, in that range, I think they estimated it at. Um, so, so how does this happen? Well, I, and of course, as an investigative journalist, I ask all these same questions myself, and I, I need answers to them, or I can't, I can't sign off on, on, you know, her being the culprit. So I begin to look at this crime, and you can quickly see that, uh, all right, with a little bit of planning, as you said, you can a absolutely do, as, as they begin to look deeper at this crime, the, the evidence starts popping up, and the evidence supports uh, one person doing it for sure. Because um, Doug is found inside this horse trough in the concrete, wrapped in a shower curtain, all right? And Tracy Fortson has a brand new shower curtain in her house. She, there's a receipt in her house from her buying the shower curtain at Walmart. Now we go 15 miles away from her house, we go to a feeding store. And there she is, buying a horse trough and 15 bags of cement. At the feeding store, Tracy right. Fortson's doing this. Now, how does she get him into this horse trough with this cement? Well, it's very simple once you see the layout and you're, you know, this is why I like to, guys, I like to get onto the property. I like to, you know, walk in the shoes of my murderer or my victims and see what happens because you really got a feel for it. So getting out there, you can quickly see that. Doug's back porch, if you back the truck up to his back porch, it would be level, okay, number one. Number two, Tracy drives the truck. Number three, there's cement splashes all over the back of that truck, fresh cement splashes. Number four, he was murdered on his couch. He was shot in the head on his hot couch inside his trailer. How do we know this? Because all the, uh, once they really took a look inside that house and they flipped over the cushions to the uh, couch, they could see the blood, blood all over that couch where he was shot. Um, uh, and it would have been very easy for her to flip him over onto that shower curtain. The rug was covered with what we'll say, we'll call it for now, kerosene. It was probably gasoline or kerosene because once cops started investigating this, guess what? Two days later, someone tries to burn Doug's place down to cover up all the evidence. So, so as you can see, I mean, I don't want to go through and give it all away, but as you can see, there's a case really building here, you know, yeah. uh, uh, towards one person. Uh, um, and now, how, do, how does she get onto private property, right? Um, uh, that's another question that comes up. How would she know to dump him back there? Um, how would she even know that place existed, um, uh, you know? Uh, well, she knew the guy who owned the property. She dated the guy who, who, who owned the property. Uh, she hunted on the piece of land where Doug's body was found. Um, so when you start to chip away at this, you know, uh, you get inside her house, and what do you find inside of her house? Well, you find all kinds of stuff related to the murder. The murder weapon, number one. <laughs> you know, they pull a bullet out of the skull, and it matches her gun. Come on. Oh, yeah. I mean... So now, now, all right, and, 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 and now I look at all of this, and I'm like, well, geez, this is, this is a slam freaking dunk, yeah. right? I mean, I mean, really, literally, one piece of evidence after the other points to this woman. For example, there was some crude camouflage painting on the trough. Well, they find three cans of spray paint in her garage, each of them used, and they're all the same colors as the paint on the trough. Okay? See, so you've got um, enough for a jury conviction right here. Yeah, 
I mean, and 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 and, and so now now I got to ask myself this question because this is the question that comes up. She she points to this and her supporters. Don't you think that's too much evidence? Don't you think that she could have been framed? And I'm like. Okay, let's take a look at that. Let's sit down and take a look at that. So I spent a couple of months looking at it from that point of view. And, and this book is a little, written a little bit differently. There's a lot of first-person accounting in this because me and Tracy start to trade barbs. I start to push back on her. She starts to push back on me, telling me, you know, uh, I don't know what I'm doing and all this stuff. So Because I start asking her hard questions. And so I had to include myself in the story because it, it, that's just the way it worked out where where we started to fight, she, she dropped out, she came back in, that sort of thing. Um, so I looked at it from that point of view. Could she have been framed? Well, certainly. Certainly that happens, right? Right. But do I think she was framed in this case? Hell no, I don't think she was framed. Hell no. Yeah, was that um, just because of the feeling of, of when you were talking to her? Did you just, did you just pick that up from vibration type thing? Uh, no, I actually, you know, I don't... I didn't pick up much from Tracy as being this psychopathic murder. I mean, I've written 36 books, and uh, I've written, I've interviewed lots and lots of psychopaths, lots of serial killers. I, I, can, I can definitely tell when I'm talking to a psychopath. Tracy did not give me that type of vibe whatsoever. Doesn't mean she didn't commit this murder, because anybody can commit murder under, under circumstances, you know, and, and she had a proclivity towards violence. When you look at her background, when you look at her, her childhood, She's been around violence, so the wires were in there for her to commit violence, for sure, okay? Right. Um, uh, so, no, I didn't. I didn't pick that up on her. Um, you know, uh, it, it's an interesting case. I mean, that's why the producer, going back to the beginning, that's why the producer said, Matt, you're the one to dig into this, because, you know, because uh, the producer, my producer friend was like, I believe she's innocent. And I'm like, well, that's, that's interesting. I've got to look at this. So, so yeah, so... I began to rip this thing apart, and, and one of you said it earlier, you got enough for a jury conviction. And certainly enough, if I'm sitting on the jury, I have to vote guilty. I have to. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, did, you, you have not you, given me a plausible well, explanation not to. Yeah, right? Well, was there did, a did she have any alibis? Yeah, her alibis are, are interesting. Her alibis are... All right, so now let's go back to reason why Doug was murdered, perhaps. She begins to lay out this case of, well, first of all, she claims that because of the sexual harassment um, suit she lodged against the sheriff's department, specifically the sheriff, Ray Sanders at the time, and that that suit became public and there was a big article written about it locally, that that sheriff became so pissed off at her that he wanted to get back at her so bad that he framed her for murder. Okay. Now, look at the video. You know, that's plausible. But that suit didn't even really start yet when Doug was murdered. There was no, there hadn't been a court date. Uh, nothing had been done. No one had been interviewed about it. And we're not talking about, like, sexual misconduct against her. What we're talking about is some sheriff's deputies sitting around the office, males, telling raunchy jokes in front of a female. That's what we're talking about. Now, that's not to say that that wouldn't offend a female. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, is that enough to frame a person for murder? In my no. book, no. Okay? No. Now, here's another thing. She quits the department because she says she's not being paid enough because of her gender and she's being treated unfairly. She mentions nothing about sexual harassment when she quits. She goes to unemployment. She denied unemployment, and Ray Sanders fights her for unemployment. Then she comes up with a sexual harassment suit. Then later she says, well, it's because of that sexual harassment suit that they framed me for murder. Now, when I begin to push on that and, and, and just say, look, that, that's not what happened here. And then, there's nothing that points to that. Nothing, right? When I begin to push on that, she says, well, you ought to take a look at Doug's background because I believe Doug was a confidential informant and Ray Sanders was involved and Doug was really involved in getting rid of some big time drug dealers and they were getting close and uh, they killed Doug and they framed me for it. And, and I just throw up my hands at that point and said, all right, so this doesn't work, now we're going to go to this? 
I, I don't get that. That doesn't make any sense to me, you know. Um, we go from the sexual harassment to now this. He was a confidential informant. Oh. Yeah, why, why would your story change if, if the first one was supposed to have been true? Exactly. Exactly. So I, I, I begin to push on her with all of this and say, come on. You know, she'd send me documents, uh, quotes, quote, documents, end quote, and I'd get them, and I'd be like, what is this proof? What, this, this proves zero. What, do you, what is this proof? Oh, she'd say, oh, this proves this guy lied. I said, it, it does not prove anybody lied. It proves nothing. One of her big contentions during her first trial, and she had to, was found guilty twice. One of her big contentions in the first trial was that the ballistics expert, um, you know, fudged her story on the stand and lied about the bullet being ballistically connected to Tracy's gun. Hmm. Um, and then I go and I do some digging, and I find that this ballistics expert, the same woman, is later fired after Tracy's trial, years after Tracy's file, for falsifying reports. Uh -oh. And it's like, oh, it's like, oh, let's check this out. Uh-oh. So I begin to dig deeper into that, and I find more documents that show that this woman is guilty of being lazy. She's not guilty of any nefarious activity. She's guilty of being lazy. In other words, she's guilty of, like, all right, I took, you know, I fired, I, I fired, you know, the code, the, the code says you're supposed to fire a weapon 12 times when you're doing a test. She fired a 10 and put 12 down on the sheet. This is the kind of thing she was guilty of falsifying records for, and she was fired for it. Now, okay, lying's lying. You could, you could argue that. Right. But you know what? Ballistics, when it comes to a bullet matching a weapon, it's black or white. Yeah, you There's only no need to fire it once. <laughs> That's right. There's no gray area there. It's like a, it, when they say it's a, it's, a, it's a fingerprint, it is. It's a fingerprint. Because all you have to do is measure the striations how deep they are, how wide they are, and what they look like, and put them up to the barrel of that gun. And you'll know right away, you know. So uh, she, what she was doing was just seizing on any opportunity she could to say, aha, you know what I'm saying? Um, I, I mean, and then the most obvious thing that really nobody picked up on that I go through in the book a little bit, the most obvious thing, all right, if I could just set it up for a minute. So now, Tracy Fortson admits to, there's receipts of her buying the cement. There's testimony from the people at the store that saw her uh, a, a, a couple of days before Doug Benton goes missing. Buy the cement, buy the horse trough, drive away with it. There's receipts, there's video of her at the Walmart buying the shower curtain, buy her, buying some other cleaning things. You know, scrub brushes clean and stuff. I mean, the couches were scrubbed of the blood and everything, okay? Um, the paint cans in her uh, garage. Now, all right, let's say she was framed, right? If she was framed, that means someone would have to be following her 27, 24-7 and say to themselves, aha, today she bought a horse trough. Today she bought cement. This is what we're going to do tomorrow. We're going to kill him tomorrow. We're going to bury him in that. Otherwise, why would he end up in it? Right? right. So, so if, she, if she's framed, someone's got to be following her 24-7, waiting for the opportunity and saying, oh, I think it's here now because she bought this horse trough. That does not make any plausible sense. None. None. There's, there's no way that she could have been framed in that manner. Right? There's just there's just no way. What 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 was the purpose? Like, what do you, do you know the motive behind why she would kill him? If if like, what were they thinking? Well, I mean, the motive. A big question of mine was the motive too, and the motive I think was just anger. Like, you left me. You know that it's the it's the age old. Uh, it's you know. I, People murder for only three reasons. There's only three motives for murder. Three. There's, do you know what they are? There. It's money, revenge, or love. Now, there are branches off each one of those, of course. In the money category, you could 
you could include a gangbanger who wasn't paid for his drugs, right? You could include that in money. Right. So what I'm saying is money, revenge, love. Here we have probably two of those for the motive. Love, revenge. You're not leaving me, hey, Doug. Nobody leaves me, Doug. Any, any, any relationship this woman had, I, I went in her background, always ended like this. It always ended bitterly. It was both drama, uh, nothing like this, of course, but always a type of drama. Um, her, her, her own father, she admits to me, was very violent with her own mother, a lot of times in front of her, pulling a gun on the mother, beating the mother, savage alcoholic. So she grows up watching this type of thing. That's how she deals with relationships, right? Um, so it was like, and her and Doug were very, very contentious, very, very volatile. I mean, the slightest thing would set him off, and they'd be, you know, that'd be it, you know. So this, so, this was just a toxic relationship. Right, the sooner, sooner or later, one of the two was going to kill each other. Yeah, so, you know, she snaps and kills him, and then she's got to cover it up, and, you know, and, and that's what I see. That's what I see. I mean... I don't see any other plausible explanation for this. I mean, I really don't. Uh, you know, and and one of her biggest arguments is, well, look, I'm a cop. You know, I know forensics, which is a stretch. Just because you're a cop, it does not mean you know forensics. Yeah. But, um, she, <laughs> I'm a cop. Yeah. I know forensics. Why would I leave all this evidence out in the open? Why would I leave the gun at my house? Why would I? Why would I? go buy the horse trough and leave it out there. And all, Why would I do all of that? Why would I? I know why. It's not in my book because I find it out later. Um, I find it out later after the investigation, after the book is written, but I know why now. I know exactly why all that was done now. And the reason is she never once thought for a minute that that body was going to turn up. And she knew that no body, no crime. There's no way that anybody can prosecute her for murder if Doug just remains missing. And there's just no way that she, she considered that body was ever going to be found. It just was by happenstance that that body was found. Uh, no. uh, even the area where the guy was driving his ATV through, he, he, I, 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 I was out there with him. He's like, I never drive through here. It just happened I was through here one day because my daughter got her ATV, got flat right nearby here, so I had to come out here. And I smelt it, and I walked over to it. Um, so I also believe there was someone who's gonna, who, who was involved who was going to bury that trough for her. Well, my, Michael, was, there, I, there it is. Bam. Uh, before the show, me and Al was talking about this, and that was my question. I, I can understand you camouflaging a horse trough and, and putting it on cattle land. I, I can kind of understand that. <clears throat> Excuse me. But why would you leave it above ground? Why not? You've, you've got it full of concrete. Why not drop it in a lake where it's yeah. less likely to be found? You know, cattle there ranchers a, check these troughs. Well, let me tell you, there was a, there's a pond on that property, a big, huge pond on, it, on that private property. And where this thing was, let me tell you, uh, it wasn't the last place that, that this thing was going to be. I knew that right away when I saw it, when I was out there, and I was interviewing a couple of people out there. I knew, I knew right away what happened because one of, the first, one of the people I was interviewing didn't disclose some certain information to me. I find it out later on that day from someone else. And that, to me, was just bang. There it is. There it is right there. I got it. That's it. That's why she wasn't worried about any of that stuff. I mean, there was a, there was a note attached to Doug's truck that was handwritten. The handwriting experts claim that Doug didn't write it, that she wrote it. Not only that, but that it was taped to his windshield with fingerprint tape. Well, who has fingerprint tape? <laughs> a former sheriff would have, a deputy would have fingerprint tape, right? So none of this stuff mattered to her because there was never supposed to be a body. And if they never found that body, there's no way it could, she... He could be tied back to her. There's just no possible way. No possible way. You need that body. And there's just no way that body was supposed to be found. It, it just was by happenstance that, you know, this guy ran into it that day. He wasn't supposed to run into it. So ha having said all of this, the, the question begs to be asked, do you think she acted alone? Because who was going to help her get 
that 3,000 pound trough into that lake? Well, I believe definitely she acted alone, but I believe that after the deed was done, it was picking up the phone and saying, oh my God, what have I done? I need help now, or I'm going to jail for the rest of my life. That's what I believe happened. It was, it was call a friend, phone a friend. It was, it was phone <laughs> a friend. A lifeline. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it was time to use a lifeline, and, and believe me, she probably had some stuff on the person that she asked for help. She probably had some, you know, there was probably a, it was probably a quid pro quo here. Uh, well, the, re- the, the how she got the trough off the truck was very simple, with a pulley system. All she did was tie a rope to a tree. They even cut that section of the tree out and brought it into court, where she tied a wire to a tree, and she tied the other end of the wire to the trough, and she just drove the truck away and plop, there it mm-hmm. goes. And, and, and so that's how she got it off by herself. Yeah, with uh, a plastic that trough, liner. That trough was not supposed to end up there. It was supposed to go there, but it was not supposed to end up there. That's that's definitely my 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 theory at this point. And yeah, and did you, did and, you ever you know, figure out who she called or who she would use for to to help her? Did you ever kind of figure out that? Yeah, oh, yeah absolutely. I I absolutely know, and I just rather not say uh, uh, that could you know that person. Is oh, not that person. Involved. They were they were not charged or anything like that. No, that person is not. Uh, like I say, I just, I just found, I just figured this. I, I just found this out maybe three, four weeks ago while I was out there, um, while I was out there doing some filming. Um, uh, yeah, um, wow. yeah. So I mean, I know, you know, and and there's no chance. Uh, you know, that area there is. Everybody knows everybody. It really is. It, it's, you know, when you that's it's it's like its own little bubble. You know, the, the, the county with the sheriffs and the people and the ranch hands. and the, It really is. It really is like its own little bubble that doesn't exist beyond that area, you know. Right. And yeah. th- that's why in the show, uh, I, I was out there filming with Crime Watch Daily, and, 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 and one of the bits they used for me was, I believe a third-party investigative body should come in and reexamine this whole case. And, and, I, and I said that, and, you know... I got some pushback from Ray Sanders' people, the sheriff. Well, why did you say that? Do you think Ray Sanders said I said, no, that's not why I said that. Uh, the reason I said that is because there's some other stuff that needs to be figured out still. Uh, and mm-hmm. there might be some other people that need to be prosecuted. Who knows? You know, that's why I said that. Well, It'll never happen, but, you know. I, I think yeah. it should because it, it's never wise for a police agency to investigate itself in something like this. Because she's still, whether you like it or not, she's still connected, and their sheriff's department is implicated in a part of the crime. And, and you know, and yeah, and you're right, and the GBI was involved, the Georgia, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, they were involved. Okay. And, yeah, they, they, they became involved, and that was, that was one of her, one of the things she said to me was, you know, it just so happens that the GBI is at the sheriff's department the minute they find Doug's body on the property. Don't you think that's a coincidence, she says to me? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I, actually I do, because the GBI is always stopping by the sheriff's department. There's a local GBI agent that, you know, is always dealing with the sheriff's department. You should know that as a sheriff's deputy. Of course, of course, you know. And, and a call comes in that the possible body's found on a farm. You don't think that GBI agent is there? He's not going to go out there with them? Of course he's going to. Come on. Yeah. You know? What, you know, so... What do you feel about in, um, when justice is handled this way? Do you think do, do you think there's an overall issue with, with the way crimes like this are handled? I don't. I mean, I think this was handled properly. Uh, uh, Tracy wants to rip it apart. Even Doug's mother wants to rip this investigation apart. They're all they're looking for these big conspiracies and everything, and and I don't see any of that. I think this was handled properly. A body's found. The, one of the first people they go to talk to is the girlfriend of the of the victim, and then and then they talk to her, and they're they're satisfied with what they hear from her, and then they start talking to all his friends and other people, and all those people start to say. I believe she did something because, let me tell you, them two, she was, you know, and they start, you know, okay, so they go back to her, and they start talking to her. So, absolutely, I, I think, I, you know, I, it, look, 
She could be innocent. But what I'm saying is, and like I said in, 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 in my interviews for this book, is that if I'm on the jury, I'm voting guilty. That's it. i got to vote guilty. I have to vote guilty. And that's how justice works, you know. Um, she kept telling me she was going to come up with this and come up with that and come up with this. For example, she says, I have, my daughter has a tape of one of Doug's friends telling her that he was coerced into saying that I, I was involved and that they told him to lie in the stand and all this. I never got that tape. After I finished reading, after I finished writing this book and I started to film some stuff for Crime Watch Daily, all of a sudden she's willing to give that tape up now. You know, and we didn't use the tape. I said, you can't use that tape on, on crime on, on this segment. Yeah. Did you, did you, can you verify that tape? And, and, and even the producer was like, it's definitely him. It's definitely the friend. I'm like, how do you know that? Yeah. Because this friend, they went back to this friend, and he would never sign an affidavit, or he would never go on record to say that that was him on the tape. So unless he does that, that's nobody on the tape to me. That's how justice works. All right? Yeah. We could sit here all day and say, yep, that's his voice, that's him, it's got to be him. But until he is willing to sign an affidavit and go into a court of law, hold up his hand and say, that's me on that tape, and yes, that's true, then that's nothing. Right. It means nothing. Yeah. Right. It, it absolutely is meaningless. But, you know, the, the, the whole mentality of the country is aimed toward conspiracy nowadays. So, you know, a lot of times that can really you know, get in the way of justice. Absolutely. I mean, um, yeah. and I think in many ways, you remember, she's been in jail for 16 years, right? 16 years. So, um, 17 years. In many ways, I think uh, Tracy Fortson saw this making a murderer type of vibe that's going on in the community and said, you know what, I, I, this is my time now, you know, this is my time to step up now. Um, everybody likes that narrative. That's a better narrative. Um, lots of people said to me, don't you think there's too much evidence against her? I said, no, <laughs> I don't. I said, you know what, you know, uh, it, it, 99 million times out of 100 million, you know, 999 million times out of 100 million, um, it's the simple answer. It's, it's not the conspiracy-minded answer of all of this shit happened. You know, it's, 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 it's the simplest answer. And here you have evidence that points to a person, and that's the answer. I mean, you there know... A lot I, of I, evidence. I, oh, a, a I, lot of evidence. Yeah, I mean, yeah, even more than we've discussed. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's endless, really. If it was you know, one or two things, I could I could even, you know, say, well, that's chance. Right. You know, if you found, you know, cans of spray paint, you know, in, in my shop, and there was a car that just broke into, you know, the Piggly Wiggly down here that was a black car, you could say I did it. Love me the Piggly Wiggly, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's it's just one thing after another. She was seen purchasing all the equipment that was used in the murder prior to I, the I mean, murder. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. I, Segment is still left in the back of her truck. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, good Lord, you know, there's about 15 things that you've mentioned that any one of them would get a grand jury indictment. Yeah, yeah. no doubt about it. And, and, and again, and again, look at it from the point of view of she leaves the body never found. You know why all of this is left behind now. You, you, I, I understand it now. It makes more sense to me now, you know, because um, uh, none of it's going to matter, really. He's just going to disappear off the face of the earth. You know, um, there was also a witness down the street from the home that, you know, here's another piece of evidence. There's also a witness down the street from the home that here's a gunshot, runs out of her house, looks around, and a half hour later sees Tracy Fortson drive away from Doug's house. I mean, so, okay, uh, you, you got to put that together a little bit, but, you know, what does that look like to me? 
looks like to me like she went in there and shot him in the head. And then she came back later and cleaned it all up. That's what it looks like to me. Um, you know, uh, and she says, oh, there's no way. There's no way that that person could have heard a gunshot. There's no way. And it's like, why would that person come forward and say, I heard a gunshot? And then I see Tracy drive away. What reason would that person have to say that? You know, there's no ulterior motive from this person. It's just a, it's a random person, right? <laughs> you know, um, you know, uh, people just don't involve themselves in something like that with that kind of claim, right? Uh, um, you know, it just doesn't happen, you know? And, and you seized upon it, really. We live in such a conspiracy-driven world that justice and blue and uh, is questioned at every step of the way today, and maybe it should be. Maybe it should be. Maybe the other end of this is better law enforcement, better justice. You know, maybe that's what's going to come out of this, you know? Yeah, better, better planning. <laughs> or better, better murder planning, absolutely, yeah. you know? Um, <laughs> you know? I mean, if, if, if I'm going to get rid of a body... I'm going to stay with the body until it's getting rid of. I'm not going to dump it and leave. I mean, that's the mistake she made, maybe. You know? Um, well, that's, yeah. that's having ego, right? She she just didn't think it would be found. And, and uh, in a way... I mean, I, I've interviewed serial killers. And I interviewed one serial killer for five years. And one of the main things he told me was, and he made this clear all the time, he said, your most vulnerable time is when you are with that body. And, and you don't know where that body is, right? So, so, yeah, you need to put distance between you and that body if you don't want to get caught. But, Dan, you better make sure you know where that body is and where it ends up, you know, if, if you're looking to get rid of it. And, uh, yeah, I just think, I don't think that this guy was supposed to be found in that cement. Don't think so, that. so could... You know, both of you guys just made a really good point that all kind of came together, that the arrogance of her. Do you think that she underestimated the local authorities because she was part of them at one time? So Maybe. she thought they were stupid. Maybe she thought they were Barney Fife, you know, but uh, they weren't. I mean, they did everything right, really, when you look at this. Yeah. When you really look at this from a law enforcement perspective, they did everything right. You know, another thing is, you know, when they went in that Friday uh, into Doug's house on the welfare check, something very significant happens. There's nothing in there. There's no smell. Everything's in order. But when they go back in on the Sunday, after they find his body, it's a totally different scene. As soon as they open the door, the, the smell of kerosene just overwhelms them. There's a fan in there blowing. There's two candles on the ground that had burned out. Those two candles were supposed to light that trailer on fire and burn yes. it down, but they burned themselves out is what happened. And who would know, right, who would know that there's an investigation going on? Someone involved yeah. in it, mm. yeah. right? So, I mean, look, when you start adding it up, you know, look, it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck. It's a duck, you know? <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. Lady Duck. I mean, and, and if you've ever watched MacGyver, you know you're supposed to use cigarettes, <laughs> not candles. Yeah, <laughs> balloons. If, if you've ever been in the mafia, you know it's balloons filled with gasoline. <laughs> you know. uh, well, there you have it. We get it all here. You get, you hear everything here. Wow. Yes. Yeah. This is, uh, it's, it's great. Um, now, so the book is out now, of course. I guess it's been out for a little while. What do you got planned next? Yep. I am writing a book uh, about a uh, case uh, in Upper Michigan, way, way up uh, above the lake, way up there, where uh, the gentleman went missing uh, and was later found. And then another gentleman goes missing, and he's later found. And there's a female that's pretty close to two of them. <laughs> uh, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, but it's... Uh, it's a really interesting story from a law enforcement perspective. A female sheriff, a female chief, uh, uh, a female police chief up there, a small department, seven guys. She's the chief. She gets an inkling that she knows who it is, and the big, the big shots, the, the Michigan State Police, no one wants to believe her. 
no one believes her. Mm. They, they're all telling her, you're going down the wrong road, we're not helping you. And she sticks with this case. And boy, did she solve a hell of a case. Wow. Well, it's yeah. always interesting having you on. It's uh, M. William Phelps. Um, thanks very much. You really uh, excite the uh, true crime in, in all of us. <laughs> hey. Uh, well, yeah, we'll get some mail for that, too, but hey, I'm glad I can. <laughs> well, you know, like I said, it it's, gets to a point where uh, you, you just can't win. You can't please everybody. Yeah, yeah, it takes the focus off of me, at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can take it. I've taken, I've taken some pretty pretty nasty hits throughout my career. If you ever want to know what people are really feeling, just go on TV once a week and you're on the show. And trust me, hundreds and hundreds of people will let you know how they're feeling about you. Yeah, yeah no, radio's enough, but thanks. <laughs> yeah, right, right, you got it. All right, guys, hey, thanks. Well, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Bert, thank you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.